One Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. At that time, Macondo was a village of twenty adobe houses, built on the bank of a river of clear water that ran along a bed of polished stones, which were white and enormous, like prehistoric eggs. The world was so recent that many things lacked names, and in order to indicate them, it was necessary to point. Every year, during the month of March, a family of ragged gypsies would set up their tents near the village, and with a great uproar of pipes and kettle drums, they would display new inventions. First, they brought the magnet. A heavy gypsy with an untamed beard and sparrow hands, who introduced himself as Melchiades, put on a bold public demonstration of what he himself called the eighth wonder of the learned alchemists of Macedonia. He went from house to house dragging two metal ingots, and everybody was amazed to see pots, pans, tongs and braziers tumble down from their places, and beams creak from the desperation of nails and screws trying to emerge. And even objects that had been lost for a long time appeared from where they had been searched for most, and went dragging along in turbulent confusion behind Melchiadesh magical irons. Things have a life of their own, the gypsy proclaimed with a harsh accent. It's simply a matter of waking up their souls. José Arcadio Buendía, whose unbridled imagination always went beyond the genius of nature, and even beyond miracles and magic, thought that it would be possible to make use of that useless invention to extract gold from the bowels of the earth. Melchiades, who was an honest man, warned him, It won't work for that. But José Arcadio Buendía, at that time, did not believe in the honesty of gypsies. So he traded his mule and a pair of goats for the two magnetized ingots. Ursula Iguaran, his wife, who relied on those animals to increase their poor domestic holdings, was unable to dissuade him. Very soon we'll have gold enough and more to pave the floors of the house, her husband replied. For several months he worked hard to demonstrate the truth of his idea. He explored every inch of the region, even the riverbed, dragging the two iron ingots along and reciting Melchiadesh incandation aloud. The only thing he succeeded in doing was to unearth a suit of 15th century armour, which had all of its pieces soldered together with rust, and inside of which there was the hollow resonance of an enormous stone-filled gourd. When José Arcadio Buendía and the four men of his expedition managed to take the armour apart, they found inside a calcified skeleton with a copper locket containing a woman's hair around its neck. In March, the gypsies returned. This time, they brought a telescope and a magnifying glass the size of a drum, which they exhibited as the latest discovery of the Jews of Amsterdam. They placed a gypsy woman at one end of the village and set up the telescope at the entrance to the tent. For the price of five reals, people could look into the telescope and see the gypsy woman an arm's length away. Science has eliminated distance, Melchiades proclaimed. In a short time, man will be able to see what is happening in any place in the world without leaving his own house. A burning noonday sun brought out a startling demonstration with the gigantic magnifying glass. They put a pile of dry hay in the middle of the street and set it on fire by concentrating the sun's rays. José Arcadio Buendía, who had still not been consoled for the failure of his magnets, conceived the idea of using that invention as a weapon of war. Again, Melchiades tried to dissuade him. 
But he finally accepted the two magnetized ingots and three colonial coins in exchange for the magnifying glass. Ursula wept in consternation. That money was from a chest of gold coins that her father had put together over an entire life of privation and that she had buried underneath her bed in hopes of a proper occasion to make use of it. José Arcadio Buendía made no attempt to console her, completely absorbed in his tactical experiments with the abnegation of a scientist and even at the risk of his own life. In an attempt to show the effects of the glass on enemy troops, he exposed himself to the concentration of the sun's rays and suffered burns which turned into sores that took a long time to heal. Over the protests of his wife, who was alarmed at such a dangerous invention, at one point he was ready to set the house on fire. He would spend hours on end in his room calculating the strategic possibilities of his novel weapon until he succeeded in putting together a manual of startling instructional clarity and an irresistible power of conviction. He sent it to the government, accompanied by numerous descriptions of his experiments and several pages of explanatory sketches, by a messenger who crossed the mountains, got lost in measureless swamps, forded stormy rivers, and was on the point of perishing under the lash of despair, plague and wild beasts, until he found a route that joined the one used by the mules that carried the mail. In spite of the fact that a trip to the capital was little less than impossible at that time, José Arcadio Buendía promised to undertake it as soon as the government ordered him to, so that he could put on some practical demonstrations of his invention for the military authorities, and could train them himself in the complicated art of solar war. For several years, he waited for an answer. Finally, tired of waiting, he bemoaned to Melchiades the failure of his project, and the gypsy then gave him a convincing proof of his honesty. He gave him back the doubloons in exchange for the magnifying glass, and he left him, in addition, some Portuguese maps and several instruments of navigation. In his own handwriting, he set down a concise synthesis of the studies by Monk Hermann, which he left José Arcadio, so that he would be able to make use of the astrolabe, the compass, and the sextant. José Arcadio Buendía spent the long months of the rainy season shut up in a small room that he had built in the rear of the house, so that no one would disturb his experiments. Having completely abandoned his domestic obligations, he spent entire nights in the courtyard watching the course of the stars and he almost contracted sunstroke from trying to establish an exact method of ascertaining noon. When he became an expert in the use and manipulation of his instruments, he conceived a notion of space that allowed him to navigate across unknown seas, to visit uninhabited territories and to establish relations with splendid beings without having to leave his study. That was the period in which he acquired the habit of talking to himself, of walking through the house without paying attention to anyone, as Ursula and the children broke their backs in the garden, growing banana and caladium, cassava and yams, ahuyama roots and eggplants. Suddenly, without warning, his feverish activity was interrupted, and was replaced by a kind of fascination. He spent several days as if he were bewitched, softly repeating to himself a string of fearful conjectures, without giving credit to his own understanding. Finally, one Tuesday in December, at lunchtime, all at once he released the whole weight of his torment. The children would remember for the rest of their lives the august solemnity with which their father, devastated by his prolonged vigil and by the wrath of his imagination, revealed his discovery to them. The earth is round, like an orange. Ursula lost her patience. If you have to go crazy, please go crazy all by yourself, she shouted, but don't try to put your gypsy ideas into the heads of the children. José Arcadio Buendía 
impassive, did not let himself be frightened by the desperation of his wife, who, in a seizure of rage, smashed the astrolabe against the floor. He built another one. He gathered the men of the village in his little room, and he demonstrated to them, with theories that none of them could understand, the possibility of returning to where one had set out by consistently sailing east. The whole village was convinced that José Arcardio Buendía had lost his reason when Melchiades returned to set things straight. He gave public praise to the intelligence of a man who, from pure astronomical speculation, had evolved a theory that had already been proved in practice, although unknown in Macondo until then. And as a proof of his admiration, he made him a gift that was to have a profound influence on the future of the village, the laboratory of an alchemist. By then, Melchiades had aged with surprising rapidity. On his first trips, he seemed to be the same age as José Arcadio Buendía. But while the latter had preserved his extraordinary strength, which permitted him to pull down a horse by grabbing its ears, the gypsy seemed to have been worn down by some tenacious illness. It was, in reality the result of multiple and rare diseases contracted on his innumerable trips around the world. According to what he himself said as he spoke to José Arcadio Buendía while helping him to set up the laboratory, death followed him everywhere, sniffing at the cuffs of his pants, but never deciding to give him the final clutch of its claws. He was a fugitive from all the plagues and catastrophes that had ever lashed mankind. He had survived Pelagra in Persia, scurvy in the Malayan archipelago, leprosy in Alexandria, beriberi in Japan, bubonic plague in Madagascar, an earthquake in Sicily, and a disastrous shipwreck in the Strait of Magellan. That prodigious creature said to possess the keys of Nostradamus, was a gloomy man, enveloped in a sad aura, with an Asiatic look that seemed to know what there was on the other side of things. He wore a large black hat that looked like a raven with widespread wings, and a velvet vest across which the patterner of the centuries had skated. But in spite of his immense wisdom and his mysterious breadth, he had a human burden, an earthly condition that kept him involved in the small problems of daily life. He would complain of the ailments of old age. He suffered from the most insignificant economic difficulties. And he had stopped laughing a long time back because scurvy had made his teeth drop out. On that suffocating noontime, when the gypsy revealed his secrets, José Arcadio Buendía had the certainty that it was the beginning of a great friendship. The children were startled by his fantastic stories. Aureliano, who could not have been more than five at the time, would remember him for the rest of his life as he saw him that afternoon, sitting against the metallic and quivering light from the window, lighting up with his deep organ voice the darkest reaches of the imagination, while down over his temples there flowed the grease that was being melted by the heat. José Arcadio, his older brother, would pass on that wonderful image as a hereditary memory to all of his descendants. Ursula, on the other hand, held a bad memory of that visit, for she had entered the room just as Melchiades had carelessly broken a flask of bichloride of mercury. Ah, it's the smell of the devil, she said. Not at all, Melchiades corrected her. It has been proven that the devil has sulfuric properties, and this is just a little corrosive sublimate. Always didactic, he went into a learned exposition of the diabolical properties of cinnabar. But Ursula paid no attention to him, although she took the children off to pray. That biting odour would stay forever in her mind, linked to the memory of Melchiades. The rudimentary laboratory, 
in addition to a profusion of pots, funnels, retorts, filters and sieves, was made up of a primitive water pipe, a glass beaker with a long, thin neck, a reproduction of the philosopher's egg, and a still the gypsies themselves had built in accordance with modern descriptions of the three-armed alembic of Mary the Jew. Along with those items, Melchiadesh left samples of the seven metals that corresponded to the seven planets, the formulas of Moses and Zosimus for doubling the quantity of gold, and a set of notes and sketches concerning the processes of the great teaching that would permit those who could interpret them to undertake the manufacture of the philosopher's stone. Seduced by the simplicity of the formulas to double the quantity of gold, José Arcardio Buendía paid court to Ursula for several weeks so that she would let him dig up her colonial coins and increase them by as many times as it was possible to subdivide mercury. Ursula gave in, as always, to her husband's unyielding obstinacy. Then José Arcardio Buendía threw three doubloons into a pan and fused them with copper filings, orpiment, brimstone and lead. He put it all to boil in a pot of castor oil until he got a thick and pestilential syrup which was more like common caramel than valuable gold. In risky and desperate processes of distillation, melted with the seven planetary metals, mixed with hermetic mercury and vitriol of cypress, and put back to cook in hog fat, for lack of any radish oil, Ursula's precious inheritance was reduced to a large piece of burnt hog cracklings that was firmly stuck to the bottom of the pot. When the gypsies came back, Ursula had turned the whole population of the village against them. But curiosity was greater than fear. For that time, the gypsies went about the town making a deafening noise with all manner of musical instruments, while a hawker announced the exhibition of the most fabulous discovery of the Nassianzanese so that everyone went to the tent, and by paying one cent, they saw a youthful Melchiadesh, recovered, unwrinkled, with a new and flashing set of teeth. Those who remembered his guns that had been destroyed by scurvy, his flaccid cheeks and his withered lips, trembled with fear at the final proof of the gypsy's supernatural power. The fear turned into panic, when Melchiadesh took out his teeth, intact, encased in their gums, and showed them to the audience for an instant, a fleeting instant in which he went back to being the same decrepit man of years past, and put them back again, and smiled once more with the full control of his restored youth. Even José Arcardio Buendía himself considered that Melchiadesh's knowledge had reached unbearable extremes, but he felt a healthy excitement when the gypsy explained to him alone the workings of his false teeth. It seemed so simple and so prodigious at the same time that overnight he lost all interest in his experiments in alchemy. He underwent a new crisis of bad humour. He did not go back to eating regularly, and he would spend the day walking through the house. Incredible things are happening in the world, he said to Ursula. Right across the river, there are all kinds of magical instruments, while we keep on living like donkeys. Those who had known him since the foundation of Makondo were startled at how much he had changed under Melchiadesh influence. At first, José Arcardio Buendía had been a kind of youthful patriarch, who would give instructions for planting and advice for the raising of children and animals, and who collaborated with everyone, even in the physical work, for the welfare of the community. Since his house, from the very first, had been the best in the village, the others had been built in its image and likeness. It had a small, well-lighted living room, a dining room in the shape of a terrace with gaily coloured flowers, two bedrooms, a courtyard with a gigantic chestnut tree, a well-kept garden, 
and a corral where goats, pigs and hens lived in peaceful communion. The only animals that were prohibited, not just in his house but in the entire settlement, were fighting cocks. Ursula's capacity for work was the same as that of her husband. Active, small, severe, that woman of unbreakable nerves, who at no moment in her life had been heard to sing, seemed to be everywhere, from dawn until quite late at night, always pursued by the soft whispering of her stiff, starched petticoats. Thanks to her, the floors of tamped earth, the unwhitewashed mud walls, the rustic wooden furniture they had built themselves, were always clean, and the old chests where they kept their clothes exhaled the warm smell of basil. José Arcadio Buendía, who was the most enterprising man ever to be seen in a village, had set up the placement of the houses in such a way that, from all of them, one could reach the river and draw water with the same effort. And he had lined up the streets with such good sense that no house got more sun than another during the hot time of day. Within a few years, Macondo was a village that was more orderly and hard-working than any known until then by its three hundred inhabitants. It was a truly happy village, where no one was over thirty years of age, and where no one had died. Since the time of its founding, José Arcadio Buendía had built traps and cages. In a short time he filled not only his own house, but all of those in the village with troupials, canaries, bee-eaters and red-breasts. The concert of so many different birds became so disturbing that Ursula would plug her ears with beeswax so as not to lose her sense of reality. The first time that Melchiadesh tribe arrived, selling glass balls for headaches, everyone was surprised that they had been able to find that village lost in the drowsiness of the swamp and the gypsies confessed that they had found their way by the song of the birds. That spirit of social initiative disappeared in a short time, pulled away by the fever of the magnets, the astronomical calculations, the dreams of transmutation, and the urge to discover the wonders of the world. From a clean and active man, José Arcadio Buendía changed into a man lazy in appearance, careless in his dress, with a wild beard that Ursula managed to trim with great effort and a kitchen knife. There were many who considered him the victim of some strange spell, but even those most convinced of his madness left work and family to follow him when he brought out his tools to clear the land and asked the assembled group to open a way that would put Macondo in contact with the great inventions. José Arcadio Buendía was completely ignorant of the geography of the region. He knew that to the east there lay an impenetrable mountain chain, and that on the other side of the mountains there was the ancient city of Rio Hacha, where, in times past, according to what he had been told by the first Aureliano Buendía, his grandfather, Sir Francis Drake had gone crocodile hunting with cannons, and that he repaired them, and stuffed them with straw to bring to Queen Elizabeth. In his youth, José Arcadio Buendía and his men, with wives and children, animals and all kinds of domestic implements, had crossed the mountains in search of an outlet to the sea, and after twenty-six months they gave up the expedition and founded Macondo, so they would not have to go back. It was, therefore, a route that did not interest him, for it could only lead to the past. To the south lay the swamps, covered with an eternal vegetable scum, and the whole vast universe of the great swamp, which according to what the gypsies said, had no limits. The great swamp in the west mingled with a boundless extension of water, where there were soft-skinned cetaceans that had the head and torso of a woman, causing the ruination of sailors with the charm of their extraordinary breasts. 
The gypsies sailed along that route for six months before they reached the strip of land over which the mules that carried the mail passed. According to José Arcadio Buendía's calculations, the only possibility of contact with civilization lay along the northern route. So he handed out clearing tools and hunting weapons to the same men who had been with him during the founding of Macondo. He threw his directional instruments and his maps into a knapsack, and he undertook the reckless adventure. During the first days, they didn't come across any appreciable obstacle. They went down along the stony bank of the river to the place where years before they had found the soldier's armour. And from there, they went into the woods along a path between wild orange trees. At the end of the first week, they killed and roasted a deer, but they agreed to eat only half of it and salt the rest for the days that lay ahead. With that precaution, they tried to postpone the necessity for having to eat macaws, whose blue flesh had a harsh and musky taste. Then, for more than ten days, they did not see the sun again. The ground became soft and damp, like volcanic ash, and the vegetation was thicker and thicker, and the cries of the birds and the uproar of the monkeys became more and more remote, and the world became eternally sad. The men on the expedition felt overwhelmed by their most ancient memories in that paradise of dampness and silence, going back to before original sin, as their boots sank into pools of steaming oil and their machetes destroyed bloody lilies and golden salamanders. For a week, almost without speaking, they went ahead like sleepwalkers through a universe of grief, lighted only by the tenuous reflection of luminous insects, and their lungs were overwhelmed by a suffocating smell of blood. They could not return, because the strip that they were opening as they went along would soon close up with a new vegetation that almost seemed to grow before their eyes. It's all right, José Arcadio Buendía would say. The main thing is not to lose our bearings. Always following his compass, he kept on guiding his men towards the invisible north so that they would be able to get out of that enchanted region. It was a thick night, starless, but the darkness was becoming impregnated with a fresh and clear air. Exhausted by the long crossing, they hung up their hammocks and slept deeply for the first time in two weeks. When they woke up, with the sun already high in the sky, they were speechless with fascination. Before them, surrounded by ferns and palm trees, white and powdery in the silent morning light, was an enormous Spanish galleon. Tilted slightly to the starboard, it had hanging from its intact masts the dirty rags of its sails in the midst of its rigging, which was adorned with orchids. The hull, covered with an armour of petrified barnacles and soft moss, was firmly fastened into a surface of stones. The whole structure seemed to occupy its own space, one of solitude and oblivion, protected from the vices of time and the habits of the birds. Inside, where the expeditionaries explored with careful intent, there was nothing but a thick forest of flowers. The discovery of the galleon, an indication of the proximity of the sea, broke José Arcadio Buendía's drive. He considered it a trick of his whimsical fate to have searched for the sea without finding it, at the cost of countless sacrifices and suffering, and to have found it all of a sudden without looking for it, as it lay across his path like an insurmountable object. Many years later, Colonel Aureliano Buendía crossed the region again, when it was already a regular mail route, and the only part of the ship he found was its burnt-out frame in the midst of a field of poppies. Only then, convinced that the story had not been some product of his father's imagination, 
Did he wonder how the galleon had been able to get inland to that spot? But José Arcadio Buendía did not concern himself with that when he found the sea after another four days' journey from the galleon. His dreams ended as he faced that ashen, foamy, dirty sea, which had not merited the risks and sacrifices of the adventure. God damn it, he shouted. Macondo is surrounded by water on all sides. The idea of a peninsula Macondo prevailed for a long time, inspired by the arbitrary map that José Arcandio Buendía sketched on his return from the expedition. He drew it in rage, evilly, exaggerating the difficulties of communication, as if to punish himself for the absolute lack of sense with which he had chosen the place. We'll never get anywhere, he lamented to Ursula. We're going to rot our lives away here without receiving the benefits of science. That certainty, mulled over for several months in the small room he used as his laboratory, brought him to the conception of the plan to move Macondo to a better place. But that time, Ursula had anticipated his feverish designs. With the secret and implacable labour of a small ant, she predisposed the women of the village against the flightiness of their husbands, who were already preparing for the move. José Arcadio Buendía did not know at what moment, or because of what adverse forces, his plan had become enveloped in a web of pretexts, disappointments and evasions, until it turned into nothing but an illusion. Ursula watched him with innocent attention, and even felt some pity for him on the morning when she found him in the back room muttering about his plans for moving as he placed his laboratory pieces in their original boxes. She let him finish. She let him nail up the boxes and put his initials on them with an inked brush, without reproaching him. But knowing now that he knew, because she had heard him say so in his soft monologues, that the men of the village would not back him up in his undertaking. Only when he began to take down the door of the room did Ursula dare ask him what he was doing, and he answered with a certain bitterness, Since no one wants to leave, we'll leave all by ourselves. Ursula did not become upset. We will not leave, she said. We will stay here, because we have had a son here. We still have not had a death, he said. A person does not belong to a place until there is someone dead under the ground. Ursula replied with a soft firmness. If I have to die for the rest of you to stay here, I will die. José Arcadio Buendía had not thought that his wife's will was so firm. He tried to seduce her with the charm of his fantasy with the promise of a prodigious world where all one had to do was sprinkle some magic liquid on the ground, and the plants would bear fruit whenever a man wished, and where all manner of instruments against pain were sold at bargain prices. But Ursula was insensible to his clairvoyance. Instead of going around thinking about your crazy inventions, you should be worrying about your sons, she replied. Look at the state they're in running wild, just like donkeys. José Arcadio Buendía took his wife's words literally. He looked out the window and saw the barefoot children in the sunny garden, and he had the impression that only at that instant had they begun to exist, conceived by Ursula's spell. Something occurred inside of him then, something mysterious and definitive, that uprooted him from his own time and carried him adrift through an unexplored region of his memory. While Ursula continued sweeping the house, which was safe now from being abandoned for the rest of her life, he stood there with an absorbed look, contemplating the children until his eyes became moist and he dried them with the back of his hand, exhaling a deep sigh of resignation. All right, he said. Tell them to come help me take the things out of the boxes. José Arcadio, 
the older of the children, was fourteen. He had a square head, thick hair, and his father's character. Although he had the same impulse for growth and physical strength, it was early evident that he lacked imagination. He had been conceived and born during the difficult crossing of the mountains, before the founding of Macondo, and his parents gave thanks to heaven when they saw that he had no animal features. Aureliano, the first human being to be born in Macondo, would be six years old in March. He was silent and withdrawn. He had wept in his mother's womb and had been born with his eyes open. As they were cutting the umbilical cord, he moved his head from side to side, taking in the things in the room and examining the faces of the people with a fearless curiosity. Then, indifferent to those who came close to look at him, he kept his attention concentrated on the palm roof, which looked as if it were about to collapse under the tremendous pressure of the rain. Ursula did not remember the intensity of that look again until one day when little Aureliano, at the age of three, went into the kitchen at the moment she was taking a pot of boiling soup from the stove and putting it on the table. The child, perplexed, said from the doorway, It's going to spill. The pot was firmly placed in the centre of the table, but just as soon as the child had made his announcement, it began an unmistakable movement towards the edge, as if impelled by some inner dynamism, and it fell and broke on the floor. Ursula, alarmed, told her husband about the episode, but he interpreted it as a natural phenomenon. That was the way he always was, alien to the existence of his sons, partly because he considered childhood as a period of mental insufficiency, and partly because he was always too absorbed in his fantastic speculations. But since the afternoon when he called the children in to help him unpack the things in the laboratory, he gave them his best hours. In the small separate room, where the walls were gradually being covered by strange maps and fabulous drawings, he taught them to read and write and do sums, and he spoke to them about the wonders of the world, not only where his learning had extended, but forcing the limits of his imagination to extremes. It was in that way that the boys ended up learning that in the southern extremes of Africa there were men so intelligent and peaceful that their only pastime was to sit and think, and that it was possible to cross the Aegean Sea on foot by jumping from island to island all the way to the port of Salonica. Those hallucinating sessions remained printed on the memories of the boys in such a way that many years later, a second before the regular army officer gave the firing squad the command to fire, Colonel Aureliano Buendia saw once more that warm March afternoon on which his father had interrupted the lesson in physics and stood fascinated with his hand in the air and his eyes motionless, listening to the distant pipes, drums and jingles of the gypsies who were coming to the village once more announcing the latest and most startling discovery of the sages of Memphis. They were new gypsies, young men and women who knew only their own language, handsome specimens with oily skins and intelligent hands, whose dances and music sowed a panic of uproarious joy through the streets, with parrots painted all colours reciting Italian arias, and a hen who laid a hundred golden eggs to the sound of a tambourine, and a trained monkey who read minds, and the multiple-use machine that could be used at the same time to sew on buttons and reduce fevers, and the apparatus to make a person forget his bad memories, and a poultice to lose time, and a thousand more inventions so ingenious and unusual that José Arcardio Buendía must have wanted to invent a memory machine so that he could remember them all. In an instant, they transformed the village. The inhabitants of Macondo found themselves lost in their own streets, 
confused by the crowded fair. Holding a child by each hand so as not to lose them in the tumult, bumping into acrobats with gold-capped teeth and jugglers with six arms, suffocated by the mingled breath of manure and sandals that the crowd exhaled, José Arcardio Buendía went about everywhere like a madman, looking for Melchiades, so that he could reveal to him the infinite secrets of that fabulous nightmare. He asked several gypsies, who did not understand his language. Finally, he reached the place where Melchiades used to set up his tent, and he found a taciturn Armenian, who in Spanish was hawking a syrup to make oneself invisible. He had drunk down a glass of the amber substance in one gulp, as José Arcardio Buendía elbowed his way through the absorbed group that was witnessing the spectacle, and was able to ask his question. The gypsy wrapped him in the frightful climate of his look, before he turned into a puddle of pestilential and smoking pitch, over which the echo of his reply still floated, Melchiades is dead. Upset by the news, José Arcardio Buendía stood motionless, trying to rise above his affliction, until the group dispersed, called away by other artifices, and the puddle of the taciturn Armenian evaporated completely. Other gypsies confirmed later on that Melchiades had in fact succumbed to the fever on the beach at Singapore, and that his body had been thrown into the deepest part of the Java Sea. The children had no interest in the news. They insisted that their father take them to see the overwhelming novelty of the Sages of Memphis that was being advertised at the entrance of a tent that, according to what was said, had belonged to King Solomon. They insisted so much that José Arcardio Buendía paid the thirty reals and led them into the centre of the tent, where there was a giant with a hairy torso and a shaved head, with a copper ring in his nose and a heavy iron chain on his ankle, watching over a pirate chest. When it was opened by the giant, the chest gave off a glacial exhalation. Inside there was only an enormous, transparent block with infinite internal needles in which the light of the sunset was broken up into coloured stars. Disconcerted, knowing that the children were waiting for an immediate explanation, José Arcardio Buendía ventured a murmur, mm, It's the largest diamond in the world. No, nope, the gypsy countered, it's ice. José Arcardio Buendía, without understanding, stretched out his hand towards the cake, but the giant moved it away. Five reals more to touch it, he said. José Arcardio Buendía paid them and put his hand on the ice and held it there for several minutes as his heart filled with fear and jubilation at the contact with mystery. Without knowing what to say, he paid ten reals more so that his sons could have that prodigious experience. Little José Arcardio refused to touch it. Aureliano, on the other hand, took a step forward and put his hand on it, withdrawing it immediately. It's boiling, he exclaimed, startled. But his father paid attention to him. Intoxicated by the evidence of the miracle, he forgot at that moment about the frustration of his delirious undertakings and Melchiades's body, abandoned to the appetite of the squids. He paid another five reals, and with his hand on the cake, as if giving testimony on the holy scriptures, he exclaimed, This is the great invention of our time. When the pirate Sir Francis Drake attacked Rio Hacha in the 16th century, Ursula Iguaran's great-great-grandmother became so frightened with the ringing of alarm bells and the firing of cannons that she lost control of her nerves and sat down on a lighted stove. The burns changed her into a useless wife for the rest of her days. She could only sit on one side, cushioned by pillows, 
and something strange must have happened to her way of walking, for she never walked again in public. She gave up all kinds of social activity, obsessed with the notion that her body gave off a singed odour. Dawn would find her in the courtyard, for she did not dare fall asleep, lest she dream of the English and their ferocious attack dogs as they came through the windows of her bedroom to submit her to shameful tortures with their red-hot irons. Her husband, an Aragonese merchant by whom she had two children, spent half the value of his store on medicines and pastimes in an attempt to alleviate her terror. Finally, he sold the business and took the family to live far from the sea in a settlement of peaceful Indians located in the foothills, where he built his wife a bedroom without windows so that the pirates of her dream would have no way to get in. In that hidden village, there was a native-born tobacco planter who had lived there for some time, Don José Arcadio Buendía, with whom Ursula's great-great-grandfather established a partnership that was so lucrative that within a few years they made a fortune. Several centuries later, the great-great-grandson of the native-born planter married the great-great-granddaughter of the Aragonese. Therefore, every time that Ursula became exercised over her husband's mad ideas, she would leap back over three hundred years of fate and curse the day that Sir Francis Drake had attacked Riojacha. It was simply a way of giving herself some relief, because actually they were joined till death by a bond that was more solid than love, a common prick of conscience. They were cousins. They had grown up together in the old village that both of their ancestors, with their work and their good habits, had transformed into one of the finest towns in the province. Although their marriage was predicted from the time they had come into the world, when they expressed their desire to be married, their own relatives tried to stop it. They were afraid that those two healthy products of two races that had interbred over the centuries would suffer the shame of breeding iguanas. There had already been a horrible precedent. An aunt of Ursula's, married to an uncle of José Arcardio Buendía, had a son who went through life wearing loose, baggy trousers and who bled to death after having lived 42 years in the purest state of virginity, for he had been born and had grown up with a cartilaginous tail in the shape of a corkscrew and with a small tuft of hair on the tip. A pig's tail that was never allowed to be seen by any woman and that cost him his life when a butcher friend did him the favour of chopping it off with his cleaver. José Arcardio Buendía, with the whimsy of his nineteen years, resolved the problem with a single phrase. I don't care if I have piglets as long as they can talk. So they were married amidst a festival of fireworks and a brass band that went on for three days. They would have been happy from then on if Ursula's mother had not terrified her with all manner of sinister predictions about their offspring, even to the extreme of advising her to refuse to consummate the marriage. Fearing that her stout and willful husband would rape her while she slept, Ursula, before going to bed, would put on a rudimentary kind of drawers that her mother had made out of sailcloth and had reinforced with a system of criss-crossed leather straps and that was closed in the front by a thick iron buckle. That was how they lived for several months. During the day he would take care of his fighting cocks, and she would do frame embroidery with her mother. At night they would wrestle for several hours in an anguished violence that seemed to be a substitute for the act of love, until popular intuition got a whiff of something irregular, and the rumour spread that Ursula was still a virgin, a year after her marriage, because her husband was impotent. José Arcardio Buendía was the last one to hear the rumour. Look at what people are going around saying, Ursula, he told his wife very calmly. Let them talk, she said. We know that it's not true. 
So the situation went on the same way for another six months, until that tragic Sunday when Jose Arcadio Buendía won a cockfight from Prudencio Aguilar. Furious, aroused by the blood of his bird, the loser backed away from Jose Arcadio Buendía, so that everyone in the cockpit could hear what he was going to tell him. Congratulations, he shouted. Maybe that rooster of yours can do your wife a favour. Jose Arcadia Buendia serenely picked up his rooster. I'll be right back, he told everyone. And then to Prudencio Aguilar, you go home and get a weapon because I'm going to kill you. Ten minutes later, he returned with the notched spear that had belonged to his grandfather. At the door to the cockpit, where half the town had gathered, Prudencio Aguilar was waiting for him. There was no time to defend himself. Jose Arcadio Buendia's spear, thrown with the strength of a bull and with the same good aim with which the first Aureliano Buendia had exterminated the jaguars in the region, pierced his throat. That night, as they held a wake over the corpse in the cockpit. Jose Arcadio Buendia went into the bedroom as his wife was putting on her chastity pants. Pointing the spear at her, he ordered, "Take them off."